Hey, it's Dan Murphy from Gold Shields back once again with my partner in crime, Tom Smith. How you doing today, buddy? I am so excited that this day is finally, after a year and a half, happening. <laughs> a little ridiculous. It took the taunting and, and the stalking and the harassing we had to do to get there, our guest, who also happens to be somebody who's family to us now. We love her to death on the show today. And uh, it, it's a thrill and an honor for us to have you, Cheryl. Cheryl McCollum, who is not just an exceptional person, she's an unbelievable investigator who has a career uh, of detective work and cold case work that is unmatched. And she happens to be um, one of those people who, who, who lives and breathes this and gets it on every level. She gets what's interesting to people. She gets what's interesting to detectives and prosecutors. She gets what needs to get done. She's the whole package. Plus, she's got her own podcast, which is amazing, Zone 7. I mean, talk about the Energizer Rabbit. Our <laughs> guest today, Cheryl McCollum, we are so thrilled to have you. Cheryl, thanks for giving us your time today. Are you kidding? I couldn't get on this thing quick enough. And let me tell you something. You hit it when you said family. And if there was ever a question... My sister, during the Hall of Fame, sat on the other side of the room. And you know what she kept saying? Your table was having the most fun. Your table just was hugging at each <laughs> other. Your table was genuinely having deep conversations. And I, I was like, you know what? That's the whole thing. Every single person at that table, I respect, I adore, I just love y'all. And that was such an incredible night, Dan, to listen to you. Talk about Tom, because I want to say something as clearly as I can. Most police officers were also athletes at some part of their life. And built in is competition. You could have had somebody nominate you, Dan. You could have said, hey, that's a cool thing, whatever, and never think about it again. But you didn't do that. You nominated your partner. Tom Smith, and just, again, hearing you talk about him that night was just so touching and just made it even more special to me because you don't have an ego in it. It was all about Tom that night, and you were just as happy for him and proud for him as anybody at that table. That's really kind of you to say, Cheryl. Thank you. And you know what? Uh, and and to open this, and yeah, I couldn't say that anymore, and like a bunch of memories are coming back to me, so I'm going to take a breath for a second. Uh, you hit it on the head, and, and I mentioned this in, in my speech. It meant so much more, Dan inducting me and having all new family members of ours at the event. And your sister's right. We had a blast at our table. We ha I, I do agree with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> our table was so much fun. You know, when you're involved with in this industry, which we are now, let's say it, you know, we are, and you get to meet such incredible people like you. I mean, we met you a year ago, and we act like and talk like we've known each other for 25 years. And that's what a family is. And that's you. how I feel, honestly. And, you know, it's kind of funny. We were sitting there and, I mean, historically, everybody knows about NYPD and they've heard some just fantastic stories and best detectives in the world, best training, everything. And, you know, we were sitting there and looking at all the other tables, everybody was super serious and, you know, story after story of all these heroics. But at one point, me and Dan just busted out laughing and we were like, hey, what if this was one of NYPD's? Best practical jokes ever. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom is sitting over there thinking he's about to get in the Hall of Fame, and he's not. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. <laughs> we were rolling. And then, of course, Dan immediately was like, why didn't I think of that? Like, that would have been so much better than this. It was so good. That would have yeah, been great so if, you, if, you, if you finished your speech and went, thanks, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would have been perfection oh uh, my gosh but it yeah. was really good because then kimber she started <sighs> talking about some practical jokes and then tom you mentioned some i mean that was our table while everybody else was stoic and you know you know what being was, so reserved <laughs> it was it was the proper mix of respect and honor to those who deserve it as well as a sincere appreciation for the moment people around you 
the life we have, the experiences we have, and there's laughter in there always. There should be, right? In any good life, there's always. laughter. So we had at our Amen. table- we, And you've got to have that balance. You have you know, to. That's right. And since we started this show, Tom and I, we talk all the time, but we, can, we, we shake our heads. I cannot believe the two knuckleheads like us <laughs> who used to be flunky cops in Harlem are now all of a sudden <laughs> meeting all these people who are so amazing. Like Kimber. Kimber and her mom, Paula, are two of the sweetest, most sincere human beings you could ever meet on this planet in this life. And I was rooting Agreed. for Paula. She, she went up there and she was nervous inducting her daughter, but she knows her daughter. Her daughter has an iron will, an iron will and a big heart. You don't see the two of them together all the time. That's Kimber. So when her mom went up to induct her and I could tell she was nervous and she was like, I almost don't know what to say. And we're we're just like, you know, go from your heart, just go from your heart. She did a great job, uh, mostly off the cuff, just talking about her love for her daughter and her respect for her. And it was one of those nights and all the inductees had somebody get up and speak about them in such a way that, that shed their humanity on them. This is a real person who happens to have been through A, B, and C and come out this way. And it was just, it, it's a night I'll never forget. It was an honor to get to induct Tom. It really was. And I'll admit for probably 20 minutes before I went up there, I got nervous. I got nervous. And usually when I speak in public, I'm, I have about two seconds of butterflies and then I fly right into it. But that night I was nervous because I really wanted to do a good job. I didn't want to screw it up. I didn't want to have a um, tongue-tied moment or a, uh, that kind of stuff. So I wrote it, it out flawless. in advance so it would go well. And um, I guess it worked. I don't know. I left it out all flawless. the embarrassing stuff. I told Tom. <laughs> I taunted him, Cheryl, for weeks. Oh, I told him. I said, "Oh, I'm going to tell about this," and you know, yeah. Remember no. this story? I'm like, dude, don't don't talk about that, please. No, 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 please no. don't say that. <laughs> but, you, but you you met his wife now. You know, his Angie, who is one of the sweetest human beings on the history of the earth, and who has a heart as big as all outdoors. And she stuck with him through all the ups and downs of a 30 year career. And she got her moment, which she deserves. The family deserves those moments, right? Yeah, that was one of the most touching moments. And and you're right. We had a ton of laughter. But I think every single person at our table cried, too, more than once. And I know even when I was up there, you know, presenting to Tom, I I felt toward the end, I got about five seconds <laughs> before I just... I'm just too sentimental, and I don't want to ruin it by busting out crying, but it meant that much to me, you know? But let me tell you something about both your wives that I noticed. One, they're both beautiful. I mean, gorgeous women. You, you, When they walked in, they were so striking. I first noticed them by themselves. They walked in together, and I thought, man, those are beautiful women. And then when I found out they were paired with you two, I'm like, well, talk about, you know, <laughs> falling in a gold mine. And then they were so sweet. But here's the part that I love the most. It was the support. It was the love. They are so proud of the two of you. And they they showed it in every way, not just coming there and dressing up and, you know, being polite and sweet to everybody. Your wife, Dan, was so touched by Angie's reaction. When Angie started crying, she started crying. So, you know, you talk about family, but it's not just something y'all talk about. It is something you live. And, you know, again, everything you said, Dan, from Tom's career to the children to Angie, it was it was flawless. And everybody in that room felt it. Everybody. Well, it thank you for out. that. Yep. It just, thank you so much. And and it worked out, you know, everything. And, and people ask me all the time, you know, when we're talking about the Hall of Fame, how was it? And I just said, everything you hoped happened that night happened. And that doesn't happen often. You know, that doesn't occur too often when you're, you're hoping for something so much, something always goes sideways or wrong or doesn't work out. And that didn't, that night didn't, it was all perfect. Uh, but here's why we're here, and this is this is a perfect segue to to you. The year before, your career got highlighted in everything you did, and me and you actually got the same Lifetime Achievement Award, which meant the world to me. Uh, and that's why everyone listening, that's why it was so special. That's that was the extra 
special part of it of of following up Cheryl's career with with my induction with the same award. And you know, let's talk about you and you being in the Hall of Fame and your incredible career that you are still firing up and going after, <laughs> which yeah. you know it, is amazing. So let's talk a little bit about your career and where you're at okay. now. All right. Right off the bat, I will tell you, luck, don't discount it. I have been so lucky, y'all. It is almost sad. And I'll tell you the first one. So when I was in high school, I was just itching, you know, to get in this career and I wanted to do something and I wanted to make a difference. But I didn't want to do a bunch of mock things and fake stuff. I wanted to really work and nobody was going to hire anybody 17. So the first thing I did was I got out the yellow pages, if y'all remember what those are. And I just started looking for anything that would jump out at me that I might could do. Well, I noticed this thing and it said Rape Crisis Center. And I thought, that's it. That's what I'll do. I'll get trained. I'll start volunteering. So Grady Hospital in Atlanta, our largest inner city hospital, I go down for several weekends, I think a month and a half, and I got trained. And then I selected 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. because I thought, man, that's when stuff's going to happen because my mom and grandmama always said, nothing good ever happens after midnight. And that's <laughs> what I wanted. I wanted nothing good, right? Just walking through the emergency room was an education. I mean, there were people shot, stabbed, beat half to death, run over on purpose. So just walking through there, there's all these things I'd never been exposed to. And the nurses were so fantastic and just top drawer. And then you go up to the roof where um, the hot phone is. And so you can sit out there and the red phone is there. And when it rings, you go back down to the emergency room and they tell you, you know, where the victim is. So I got to learn to interview real victims. And, you know, some went great. Some didn't. And I learned as much from those. So you know how sometimes when you're talking to somebody, I'll tell you all this story. I probably should, but I'm going to. <laughs> It'll just leave you. Like for some reason, you just, this is your friend that you're trying to introduce to somebody and you cannot think of your friend's name and you just feel stupid. You know what I'm talking about? So I've got my first victim. I go downstairs. They tell me, you know, she's in Bay 8 and I go over there and I go inside. Y'all, she has been beaten so terribly. She has been beaten so bad. I can read Reebok in her face. She's swollen. She's pitiful. And so I start to talk to her. Well, I know I'm supposed to ask certain things. Did he make you do this? Did this occur? Well, for rape, as y'all know, it's got to be the carnal knowledge of a woman against her will. I could not think of the word penis. <laughs> Couldn't think of it to save my life. And I got this far. Did he insert his... And it left me, <laughs> and she's looking at me. <laughs> I'm looking at her, and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm here to support you, <laughs> but I don't want to say something crude, but that's the only yeah. word I can think of right now. And she went, are you trying to say penis? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how good I was. Be jealous. So, so oh. then... <laughs> Oh, God. And then, of course, you know, Walt was always so fantastic. He would come after he got off work and he would sit on the roof with me and we would, you know, talk about stories and all. And that's one of his favorite stories that, oh, yeah, you know, my woman's an expert. You know, but anyway, <laughs> there was a de <laughs> there was a detective from Atlanta, Detective Black. He was what every detective should be. Smart, kind, led with his heart. Huge dude, but he was never going to take any crap from anybody. So the women, for the most part, when he walked in, immediately felt protected and could talk to him. He had a way that was just smooth and easy and fantastic. But every now and then, there was somebody that didn't want to see a man. They were too traumatized, too freaked out. 
they wanted to you know talk to me. He taught me how to interview a victim. He taught me how to write a report. He taught me how, look, you may not remember all the words, just remember their name. So just say, you know, I'm Cheryl, I'm here, and they'll know, they'll get it. And he was right. And I have used that throughout my career. It doesn't matter the words you use, whether they're proper or correct. But if they know, hey, Sarah, I'm Cheryl, I'm going to stay with you the whole time you're here, they're going to get that part. And I think that's something that, I, I honestly, it's the best training that anybody could have ever had before going into the business. Knowing you as we're starting to get to know you, it, it's um, it's clear that anybody who's a victim, if you, I mean, if you could, could call a victim lucky, the lucky piece of it would be meeting you and having you by their side, interviewing them, spending time with them, showing the empathy that comes out of you naturally. Uh, there, there's something that you can't fake about that, right? I mean, you can, I've seen people fake it. It comes across fake, it comes across forced. You've either got a real concern for people or you don't. And if you've got a real concern for people, you can be very good at victim services and law enforcement detective work because mm-hmm. you need that. Yep. And, you know, Nancy Grace and I talk about that all the time, that we started our careers as victim advocates. She was at the domestic violence shelter. So it's the same thing, learning how to put that story together. You know, if I was there and I'd had, you know, 14, 17, 22 victims, Were there any similarities that I could tell Detective Black? Because all of them did not report to law enforcement, but all of them talked to me. So if all of a sudden I keep hearing crowbar, kitchen window, crowbar, kitchen window, then I knew to tell him that. And so it was just the greatest thing that could have happened to me and for me. I'll tell you that. That's great. You know, when you have, when you have, when you have the memory of who got you where, that 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 is so great uh, to hear, you know, because I think we all had that. All of us had not not just one, you know, many. You know, I remember, you know, I, I answered a question one time of of how did you do A, B, and C, whatever it might have been, and and my answer was especially on patrol. You know, when you're a rookie, especially NYPD, Danny knows you get bounced around like like a you know a bouncy ball to whoever, you know, is available or whatever. And what I did is, is tried to take a little piece of everyone I worked with, something I liked. I like, I like what he did. And it might have been something so simple, you know, and that person doesn't even know that that little action that he did that I learned from went through my career doing that. You know, so, you know, I, ask, I, I get asked a lot too, and both of you do, you know, we all do. Hey, what's your, uh, you know, what can you lend to a, a rookie? What, what's, what advice can you give a rookie? And I say all the time, listen and watch. Listen and watch. Yep. And that'll, <laughs> that is priceless. Shut it your is mouth priceless. <laughs> and mm-hmm. listen and watch. Yep. Danny still if tells me that. Listen if you're and talking, watch. If you're talking more than <laughs> 5% of the time, you're missing some valuable stuff. You got two ears for a reason and one mouth for a reason, right? We're intended Amen. to do more listening than talking, and that's how it works. But you're right. You know, you're absolutely right. And it's and I'm glad you brought that that story up too about the um the mentorship, official or unofficial, formal or informal, there are people that we've learned from. And I, like Tom and like you, can look back and I can probably list off if I had time a slew of people I learned really important things from. One of the most important things I learned was connecting with people, learning how to sit in a room and connect with them, whether they be a victim whether they be a witness or even a perpetrator. Finding that common thread of humanity in everybody and having them look at you in a way that they feel they can talk to you because you're ineffective if people cannot feel comfortable talking to you. Uh, No matter what you're trying to do, your goal is information seeking, whether it be a patrol officer or detective. And if you can't get information out of people because you don't know how to talk to them. I learned simple things, politeness. Yes, uh, you know, thank you, please. Sir, ma'am, goes a long way. Holding doors for people. Yeah, come on, I got you. It's all good. That kind of stuff. Breaking people's defenses down. Because we had to overcome, especially in New York City, when you're wearing a uniform, sometimes you have to overcome the biases that people's lives and experiences have created within them towards that uniform. And the only way to do that is with kindness, decency, and respect. 
let them have their dignity, and then they'll see you and not just the uniform. Chief Eddie Moody, when I worked for him, I did evidence and property, and he would always say, look, that guy's been arrested. He's fixing to go to jail. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be ugly. Don't deny him water. Don't deny him food. Don't deny him a phone call or five if he needs it. You've already won. The bad guy's going to jail. But he is still a human being. And that is what Eddie preached every time I ever saw him, worked with him. And he spoke the same way, whether it was to the governor or somebody living under a bridge. The exact same way. And was just as interested in their life. So, yeah, you're right. You carry those things with you. And you and you just learn. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a great career. I just, it's, it's that one part of it's it. It's the I, show, I, I, man. I, yeah, it's the show. You're right. So, speaking of the show, lady, uh, what I, I couldn't wait to ask you this. What's your go-to case story? Like, someone says, Cheryl, let's hear, let's hear the first one that is your case that that's your presentation case you know that meant so much what which one is that let's get juicy come on i have got a lot of them i know Um, i would say (laughs) that's why i asked you (laughs) and it really some of it depends on the group so if i'm at a ladies club at a church i'm going to tell um probably um natalie holloway because there's a component there that I think moms will resonate with, especially once we get to the chapel. I mean, that story is just so, it moves me to tears almost every time I tell it. I have to take a little break. Um, if it's young, you know, rookies that, you know, want to hear something kind of fantastical, then I will tell the Olympic Park bombing because um, I was in charge of the crisis response team, which would not have been a big deal, but we had a bomb. <laughs> So that's one of those things where I tell them, say yes, volunteer, don't always chase the money. So my boss at the time sent me to the, you know, big meeting with over a over hundred chiefs and everybody. And so in that meeting, I said, well, what are we going to do if we have a mass disaster? We've got to have a crisis response plan. Well, none of them wanted to do it. Because that sounded like a lot of work. So they said, okay, you're it. Do it. And I was like, cool. Doing it. You know, there was no overtime. There was no promotion. There was no nothing. But I went back, and to y'all's point, the way y'all keep preaching, and I do as well, we had, you know, the different venues across Georgia that were going to have the games. And I happened to have a buddy in every single one of those places where there were going to be games held. From Augusta to Savannah to the, you know, Florida line, we were good. So I just did it very elementary. But the night, um, I think I got off duty at maybe midnight and the bomb went off at one something. And we had 114 people on site within 30 minutes. We were at every hospital. Um, We connected with every witness. We had it all done. It was it was unbelievable, and I could list you people that were part of that, and it would blow your mind who showed up and helped. Um, and I mean immediately. It was, it was awesome. And then, of course, um, there's 9-11. I was sent to the Pentagon during 9-11, and the cool part of the story is my sister was on Delta Flight 15 going from Germany to Atlanta and got diverted to Gander, Newfoundland. So while I'm on the way to D.C., I am desperate trying to find her because we, at this point, y'all, remember, we don't know. We don't know if there's more people on planes. We don't know what's happening. Right now, we've got four, but we don't know what's going on. Well, her husband doesn't know anything. Delta doesn't have an update for anybody that they're doing anything with over the phone. All the phones are jammed. Most of the cell phones are cutting off, if y'all remember. And finally, I heard on the radio, of all places, that most of the planes had been diverted to Gander. Well, in that moment of 
trying to get to the Pentagon and find out what's really going on and trying to process what we need to be doing, I didn't even know where Gander was. And I was like, they've taken her to Gander. I don't understand. You know, and I keep saying it. And Wall, I'll never forget it. He took my hand. He was driving because <clears throat> we had a, a little baby at the time. And he took my hand driving and he said, honey, it's Canada. They're our friend. <laughs> yep. I'm crying out thinking about it. But anyway, um, she was treated so fantastic by everybody. But here's what I did. I started calling and I found a number for the constable's office. And Walt said, I know good and well you are not calling those people when they've got all these planes diverted there and they don't know what's going on either. And I'm like, I am too. <laughs> you know, I don't know what situation my sister's in. And she's a flight attendant. She's not prepared for terrorism, you know. So the phone rings. It rang one time, and I hear this voice, and he goes, hello. And I thought, he sounds so friendly. Um, and I said, you know, my name is Cheryl McCollum, and at the time, I worked in the Fulton County Sheriff's Department. And I said, I need you to find my sister, let her know that we're all okay, but I just want her to know we love her. We know she's probably scared and all that, but just give her a hug for me. He goes, Hold on a minute. Well, he puts me on hold. And Walt said, that's it. <laughs> he's ignoring you. Ain't no way he's going to be able to go track her down on that island. Well, <clears throat> he comes back on the phone and he said, I've transferred you to my cell phone because I think I know where they're at. I think all the Delta folks are in this area. We went over there. Charlene wasn't there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said, look, I'm going to keep looking for her. And I'll give her the message. And I said, well, I appreciate it more than you know. You know, so we hung up. I felt better just knowing he sounded so friendly and, you know, all that. Well, it was probably mm, a good six hours. My phone rings. I don't know the number. It's an unusual number. So I answer it. It's Charlene. And she said, you're not going to believe this. They've set me up in the mayor's office so that I can call you. They are the nicest people. So. I mean, she had an experience that was so positive and so unbelievable. Again, that balance we talk about, there you go. So me and Ozzy Fudge, we're friends today. Ozzy Fudge? Is that not the greatest name you've ever heard? <laughs> yeah. He is just extraordinary. Sounds like and a character from Sesame Street. He is a straight up character. Let me tell you, he is, he is unbelievable, but... Charlene said it was so funny that he walked up to her and he goes, are you Charlene? And he, she said, yes. You know, like, you're a policeman. Like, why are you talking to me? And he said, she said, he picked her up, twirled her around and put her down and said, that's from your sister. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> oh, and she said she just busted out crying because, you know, that just meant so much to her. So, you know, those are a couple of the stories that, you know, I can tell it. The Gander story is much longer. It's actually even more remarkable. But those are the stories I tell. And again, it sometimes depends on the audience, you know. Yeah, so um, you do a lot of work in cold cases, do you not? Cold cases are fascinating to a lot of people. There's a lot of interest, you know. But between what we do in our show here and what you do on your show, Zone 7, which shameless plug we're going to plug the, like crazy it is an amazing podcast you're an incredible Tom and i are rookies compared to you you're so good at what you do as a podcaster but cold cases fascinate people because it's what happened who did this and sometimes it's where is this body where's this person and so i think it's fascinating that there's been such a focus in the law enforcement community for the past 20 something years i'd say on cold cases and a lot of that has to do with uh, technology that's increased, its capabilities, DNA technology, um, positive identifications through that kind of stuff have come a long way. Tell us a little bit about what you do with cold cases. Well, first of all, y'all helped me on one, and I hope everybody did listen to it, because here's the thing. When you've got folks like the two of you that can sit with me, and I just say, look, what have I missed? Talk to me. Let's walk through it. Having y'all 
I mean, you're, you're talking about 50 years experience that can sit down and say, hey, have you thought of this? Look what he says here versus what he says here. Look what he drove there. Look what he's driving now. And it's one of those things that I go, I didn't even see that. But when you point it out, it's right there. So I, that's one thing I want people to know. Again, when I talk about luck, I mean it. To have the two of you is lucky for me because my case, I can tell you the investigation just got a whole lot better. I can tell you. So if I think it's perpetrator C and Tom thinks it's C and Dan thinks it's C, I will stake my reputation on it. I can tell you it's number C or letter C, not number C. That's very kind of you. And it's also very humbling and it's honoring you. You honor us by even asking us to weigh in on a case that you're looking at. And that was a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. But, you know, ask any experienced detective and if, if they're worth their salt and they're not a sociopathic or, you know, egotist, they'll tell you that the best work on cases is done kicking it around, sharing ideas, discussing it with colleagues, coworkers, or peers. Doesn't matter what department you're from. Detective work is detective work. Who did this? And how do I build a case? And you know, the fascinating thing is the way I operate, especially at the Institute, because I'm the director of the Cold Case Investigative Research Institute. We have anybody from any discipline that's willing to help, that's willing to look at a case and say, okay, I know something about tattoos. Let me look at them. I know something about knot tying. Let me see how the ropes were tied. Um, I'm a hairdresser. I can tell you her hair looks like she dyed it at home, not at a salon. Like all of these things are helpful. Everybody in their vocation or advocation has a gift. Everybody. I don't read music. So if somebody left a threatening note just with musical notes, I don't know that says die or dead or whatever. I don't speak another language. So I'm not going to know what your tattoo says. You have to have other people. You just do. <clears throat> and it's and, always, you know, the the other set of eyes looking at the same thing. <clears throat> and and both of you just said it perfectly. That, I mean, I, I remember a couple of times you walk in with the case folder and you just put it in front of someone and go, read this. Well, what am I looking for? Just, I don't just read it. I'll ask you all the questions later. Just read it. And then you start, hey, did you see this? You're like, no, I saw this. Oh, you know, it, cold cases are like, Dan, you just said are, are fascinating uh, to work on because you're, you're literally, you know, just why we all got into police work and, and detectives. You're, you're, you're solving a mystery. You know, most of the time, you know, homicide more or less kind of got an idea who might've done it, you know, so you're, you're more trying to find them than solving a puzzle. The cold case thing is a little puzzle in putting stuff together. And that is the, the most fascinating thing around it. And to your work is extraordinary because of how often you do it and how, and how good you do it. Uh, so what's your, now my second, this, I, I kind of had two questions lined up. The, the first one was, you know, one, the second one is what's your, we all have them. What's your pain in the butt case that gets you in the side of your neck that if you start talking about it, you get a headache, you get mad, you get upset, <laughs> you get the, you know what? Ugh. Do you yeah. have one of those? I do. You um, know? I hate to say it, but I'm, I think I'm working it right now. I've got a case that I think could have gone to grand jury years ago. I've got a family that's been waiting. And I don't know what y'all know about Atlanta, but it's been put off because of Trump. And we got to indict him. Then it's been put off because the YSL trial. Then it's been put off because Bonnie Willis may or may not have had an, a, an affair with somebody she hired. I mean, it's just been... In my opinion, cases should be triaged. And none of those things that I just mentioned should have taken precedent on this case. None of them. You have got somebody that's gotten away with murder for 
30 years. And with all due respect, I could care less who D.A. Willis is sleeping with. That is grown folk, grown folk business. I don't care. I don't. I care about getting this killer off the street because here's the reality. Whatever Miss Willis did or did not do does not put my child in danger. Having this killer out, I don't know who's pumping gasoline next to her. I don't know who's eating at the restaurant that my son is at on a date. I don't, I don't know where they're at. They, they could be at the grocery store with your wife, Dan. They could be at your child's school, Tom, as a parapro, because they haven't been arrested. They haven't been convicted. And that's not okay with me, knowing these folks are out walking around free. A couple things about homicide cases. People tend to think that um, getting away with murder is a rarity. There is a ton, <laughs> literally a tractor trailer full of unsolved homicide cases in America. And it's not for lack of trying on detectives parts. It's for lack of witnesses, lack of evidence, lack of um, any real documentable understanding of who the victim is or what the circumstances of their life were. It's for a lot of reasons. It's for bodies that haven't turned up, but when they turn up, it's, it's so decayed, um, so decomposed, you can't really identify it you know, manner of death. So there's, there's all different reasons why there's witnesses who recant. There's, um, you know, evidence that's lost. I mean, because it's an old case, things happen. The human, the human element involved, the detectives across America, and I know I'm certain around the world do their best and by and large do a great job tracking down because, you know, you can't get much more. I mean, there's some cases that are heinous and make your skin crawl, but taking somebody's life is the ultimate theft. You take somebody's life, you remove them from this earthly world. And that's something that the family and that victim deserve your best. And you recognize this when you become a police detective. It's not a joke. You're speaking for those who can no longer speak for themselves. And you have a family who's looking up to you to get an answer and to get them justice. And sometimes they're more vocal than others in your face about it, but you feel that responsibility. It's, it's, it's a weight on your shoulders. I'm going to get this guy. and. You know, most detectives, for the audience who's not, are highly motivated to get that person. This is not a labor. This is like, okay, yeah, I'm like a catcher's mitt. Bring it. I'm going to get this guy. And we put our heads together. We put our effort. We don't look at the clock. It's not, I get to go home in an hour. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this guy. I'm getting this girl, whoever did this. And people need to understand that it is not easy. There are roadblocks. There are hurdles. There are issues constantly. But I love the fact that what you're doing with the Cold Case Investigative Research Institute, I love that what you're doing is putting a team, you have put a team together, you are working and taking old cases, breathing life into them and getting justice years, if not decades after the fact. And, you know, justice delayed is denied, not necessarily. Sometimes people just want an answer, right? Well, you know, I got to work with Detective Morris Nick on a case. And I had known Morris a long time, I mean, even when I was in my 20s. Just an extraordinary person. And I mean, he is probably one of the best detectives that I know, but he's even a better person. So he wanted to solve this case so bad. And he had worked on it and worked on it. And then he called me one day and he goes, okay, what do you think we can do? And I said, well, I think there's some things we can do with some of the evidence that you still have and what they're doing with DNA now, you know, Othram and Pure Gold and Francine Bardol and Jared Bradley. I mean, there's some people that are just setting this thing on fire. So, you know, you have undergarments, you have a handkerchief, you have got eyeglasses. I say we do it because you can do things now you couldn't do before. And he's one of those bulldog kind of guys. He's going to take that. He's going to run with it. He's going to make sure, hey, this is the deal. So it was a young girl that had been kidnapped and murdered. She had been brutalized in the most horrible way that you can imagine. She was raped so beautiful. Just let me say that again. I'm sorry for your editor. She was raped so 
horrifically, she bled out. So, Morris Nix, this was a case where, and y'all all know, because we all have the case, where her photograph stayed on his desk. And he kept in touch with her family. And he wanted this case done more than anything. I mean, I, and he had done some great work on just famous case after famous case. But the case of Debbie Lynn Randall, I think, was his case. You talked about, Tom, that, that case you cannot get out of your mind. So then COVID happened. You know how that goes. And then fast forward a year or two more. So he calls me and he goes, hey, I think we're close. I'll call you in a few months. I said, that sounds outstanding. And I said, congratulations. And he said, don't say it yet. I said, okay. So about eight months go by, he calls me. And you know how your, your phone, you can see he's calling you. So I was like, hey, thinking he's going to have this great, you know, ending. And I don't hear anything on the other end of the phone. And I was like, detective? And then I could hear he was crying. And he's like, Mac, we got him. We got him. After 50 years. So, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, and her brother was the only person still living in the family. I mean, their parents are gone. Debbie's gone. And he said, hey, uh, come meet with Debbie's brother and I. He wants to meet with you. And I said, okay. And Debbie, her thing, she loved Barbie dolls and stuffed animals and jump ropes and all the little things you think little girls love. And she lived across the street from a laundromat. So she would take these toys over there to play with the other children. Because she lived downtown. She didn't like have parks and that, you know, like a yard to play in. So she would go to the laundromat because there was always children there with their mamas, you know. So when I met them, her brother, as a thank you to me, gave me her little Barbie doll, little case and homemade clothes. And here's the thing. I told him, I didn't do anything. Morris Nix did this case. He just called me and I threw out some ideas, but he did them. He solved this case. And her brother said, I know it. Mars Nix is my brother now. But I want you to have this because you've got little girls in your family that'll play with them. Wow. That's a story. It gets real. It gets real between victims and, um, and their families and, and the investigating detectives. It gets very real. And bonds become formed. You spend time with them. You lose time with your family to give peace to their family. And that's, that's a sacrifice that so many people don't understand that gets done. When you decide to become a detective, you either have to be willing to do that and juggle all your personal responsibilities on top of the, the not nine to five Monday through Friday role of investigating serious crime. It is all hours, all days, all times, all weather, you name it. And you better be ready for it. And if you're not ready for it, you're in the wrong line of work. And you can complain about it, but by the end of the day, is there anything, anything sweeter? And I'm going to say, I'll say professionally, aside from, you know, great moments with your family and loved ones and friends, is there anything sweeter than closing that case? The case where something really heinous, really horrible happened to a totally innocent person. And you got the goods on the person that did it. And you lock them up, and it feels so good, doesn't it? When I, um, when I had Huck and Caroline, I never told them, monsters aren't real. Monsters don't exist. Because I knew damn well they did. I would tell them, I'm going to protect you. You are safe in this house. But I would never tell them those things like, oh, there's never going to, you know, be a boogeyman. Sure there is. I can name several. <laughs> so I also think, and it's something y'all have already touched on, but I'll touch on it again too. You have to choose that spouse correctly. It's great to have somebody that's beautiful. It's great to have somebody that is smart, but it is so much better when you have a real teammate in this thing. So 
you know, if you say, hey, they just called, I've got to go. I know we're in the middle of hosting a party. I know it's our anniversary. I know it's your birthday, whatever it is. And they are okay. They're like, what do you need from me? That to me is is something that there are many, 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 a plethora of reasons that I love Walt McCollum. But one is his unwavering support of whatever I've learned to do since we were 14. You know what? It's just going on that. And, and the reason I'm going to tell this really quick part of a story is because it, it's me and Dan, you know, in a roundabout way. And you just said that, you know, what you just said just bounced a memory of, of the Satana case, Dan. Now, Cheryl and everyone out there, real, real quick. My partner and I at the time in the gang unit were going after the head of the Nietas street gang. Now, the Nietas were pretty famous for carrying out the hit on a police officer that was contracted by the Latin Kings back years and years ago. And the head of the Nietas was that guy we couldn't get. We knew who he was. We knew he was bad. We just couldn't get anything on him enough to lock him up. We end up getting, you know, someone gives him up. We get a warrant. We hit the warrant. There's a armory of weapons and drugs and everything in there. So now we got him, but he wasn't home. So now we have to search for him. And me, Dan, and uh, one of our uh, gang member, team members, for three days searching for this guy. And you go to the partnership like me and Ange had. We got home one night, and it was the night, Danny, that he turned himself in. And I'm home, and I haven't been home. Danny hasn't been home. Chris hasn't been home. I haven't been home in three days. Get home. In the middle of eating something, finally, Chris calls, or you called. I, I actually forget and say, hey, he's turning himself in. And I was like, I just got home. Do you want to send someone whatever to get him? And Ange looked at me and went, are you out of your mind? Get in your car and drive down to the Bronx. Are you nuts? You haven't been home for three <laughs> days chasing this idiot. Now you got him. And what, you, you're what? You're going to finish eating? Get the car and go down and get him. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, and, okay. and you're exactly right. That's just, you know, that partnership. And that was just yes. the best story I just, just came up with. And, and that's true and how it happened. And the three of us met. It was like, what was it, Dan? It was like two in the morning. We met at the 5-2 precinct and he turned himself in. And, and you would not have wanted to miss that. No. Oh, no. But no, instead of her payoff. getting mad yeah. and, But you know you what? Know. It's just at the, at the moment, you're just so tired and so beat up after what we did. I mean, we were home for, th for three days. We were home for maybe an hour or two, you know, and it's just a matter of being tired and that you need that, that partner to kick you in the butt, go goodbye, <laughs> get down to work. Yeah. Uh, that and was thankfully, great. you know, and then just, you know. It just fit exactly what you were talking about. Well, it's the truth. It's absolutely the truth. You mentioned my beautiful wife, uh, Cheryl. Hey, you remember Angela? how are you? Tom? Hello, dear. <laughs> uh, and, you, you know, uh, when you mentioned how beautiful she was, you're absolutely right. But you, you, but you don't know about her. She's legally blind. <laughs> and I have described her, I have described myself to her as being very Brad Pittish. And yes. she bought it. She 100%. Bought it. Yeah. Yes. Well, when we first met, I think I called you, Brad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I it's asked a you common for an autograph. mistake. Oh, it, absolutely. It's absolutely. a burden I live with. You know, it's not, it's not easy. Oh, well, let me be clear, just <laughs> on the record. Uh, those two lovely women, they're the lucky ones. I will say that. Y'all are both brave. Y'all are handsome. Y'all are athletic. You are brilliant. They are the lucky ones. So make this sure they why, hear that part. This is why we love Cheryl. And, and we should just have a weekly show with Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> it's I all look like true. something a zebra dro has dropped under a tree. So, yeah. The Mac <laughs> hour. We'll just, we'll just do it once a week. A zebra. No, but it's true. My grandfather just, used to say know. he looks like the southern end of a northbound horse. <laughs> 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 he had a lot of great sayings. That, that's a good one. Well, I just have loved being here, and I'll tell you, I'll just tell you one more story, because we're talking about luck, and we're talking about family and people that 
truly care about you. So I would just let everybody know, since you're talking about my career, that when I was assigned to the major case division through the Crime Commission, the prosecutor assigned to that was Nancy Gray. So that's one of those things where you just think, okay, that's a God wink, and I'm going to take it because I did not know her prior to starting that. I had heard of her. Um, She was the golden child, as y'all can imagine. She was fantastic. But being able to work with her, no question, just catapulted my career. And she, when you talk about loyalty and you talk about friendship and you talk about loving each other, she has drugged me just about everywhere she's ever been. (laughs) And, you know, I tell my children all the time, look, she could have any crime scene investigator she wants. She could have any criminologist she wants. She could have any crime analyst she wants. But she has me on her show, and it is only because of loyalty. And and I just, I can't say enough about her. And then when it came time to do the podcast, she said, look, I want you to do a podcast. Do it under my umbrella, and I will help you. And I said, look, now I can talk. That I can do. Uh, the youngest of five girls, I can talk. However, <laughs> um, all the technical stuff, I can't do that. I mean, I, and I don't want to do it. I don't want to edit. I don't want to whatever all that is. I don't want to do it. She goes, no, no, no. I said, I'm going to help you. I'm going to get people to do all that for you. So when it came time to name the podcast, the reason that it's called Zone 7, in Atlanta, we have six police zones. And back in the day before cell phones and before pagers, you know, we couldn't get on the radio and say, hey, y'all, after work, we're all going to have choir practice and we're all going to go to the bar. So we would say, we're going to five nine in Zone 7. And Zone 7 was Manuel's Tavern, our cop bar. And that's where I really got my training and I really understood this is what the SOP says. This is what you need to do, right? And that's where Nancy told me the truth and Jim Birch told me the truth. And, you know, everybody, I mean, everybody was there throughout my career. So Zone 7 is not just a place, but how I live my life. That's fascinating. And, you know, real back to back to Nancy Grace for one second. Um, if you watch her on TV and everybody has seen her at some point or another, she's synonymous with true crime, but she's also synonymous with a hunt for the truth. She doesn't take nonsense from anybody. I would imagine she would be a very form- formidable force in a courtroom. Oh, honey. Going, oh, yeah. I can only imagine. <laughs> I've got stories. Yeah. And let me tell you the thing. Here's the thing about her. You know, she was a crime victim. And when her fiance, Keith, was murdered, that changed the course of her life. She was going to be an English teacher. She was going to maybe teach third grade. He was going to be a baseball coach. And then that happened. And she decided, nobody else, nobody else, I'm going to do everything I can to right any injustice that I possibly can do. And I'll tell you, sometimes I get people say, oh, she's horrible, Nancy disgrace, and all that sort of stuff. And my question is always, well, what are you doing for these victims? What are you doing to help people? Probably nothing. You're just making names up and being rude. And the deal with Nancy is you don't always see what we got to see. And so I'll tell you one quick story. I go over to our apartment, and we're discussing a case. And what can we do? What do you need from me? Do I need to go try to find the victim? And she wanted me to try to find the victim in this crack house. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll do that tomorrow. And the apartment was small. So from the living room, you could see in her bedroom. And on her bed must have been nine case files. And I said, you brought all that work home? And she went, yeah, it's not really work. I bring the case files home to pray over them. I pray for the police officer. I pray for the detective. I pray for my co-chair prosecuting. I pray for, you know, the first responders, the firefighters and the EMTs that are on the case. I pray for the victim's family by name. That's Nancy Gray, Shaw. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. Behind the scenes stuff. I love it. Love it. So... We are coming to the end of this long-awaited show, uh, but for everyone out there, we kind of touched on this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Cheryl is going to be back on our show 
because we're going to try in June to do a case on OJ and the OJ murders, which we were going to do a little while ago, but we just, we decided to hold off till right around the anniversary, which is June 12th, uh, and get something together there. So everyone out there who follows us first, thank you. And you will be hearing and seeing, uh, Mac again in the next couple of months, which we can't wait for. Uh, Dan, I mean, it, it's hard to sum up Cheryl McGollum. I mean, it is hard to put a bow on, on a show with her, but what do you think, buddy? You know, we, we have been blessed to do some amazing interviews since we started this show and we've gotten to know some people in it and we've heard some incredible stories, but few are the people who we feel so at home with. And I feel at home with Cheryl. I could sit on this call. We could, I could talk with you for 12 hours and not get bored with it because you're just such a wonderful person and you're so naturally warm, but also very smart, funny. Walt is a lucky man. He knows it. And I told him that when I saw him. But I'll tell him <laughs> again. Um, but uh, you, you really are a treasure and your heart is so filled with, with, um, with passion for, for just finding justice for people and also caring about people. And that's why you're so special. We love you, Cheryl. And we, we are so blessed to call you our sister for all intents and purposes. Well, I love y'all too. And I cannot wait to get together in Nashville. It's going to be a great time, but I appreciate y'all. And I just, again, want to say thank you for all the help that you've given me on cases. And there's another one. I probably need to call y'all tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so get ready. Anytime. But I do appreciate it. I do we're, appreciate it. I am going to call you because I, I need some help on this. We're in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so to put a bow on it, uh, an absolute legend that graced us with her presence today. And we don't say that lightly and we truly mean it. We love her absolutely with all our heart. Cheryl McCollum, my partner, Dan Murphy, and everyone please out there say a prayer for all law enforcement officers out there, their families, uh, their loved ones, because they're all in this fight together, whether they're sitting at home or they're driving around a radio car. It's the same fight. It's the same feeling. Uh, say thank you to one. Give a wave to one on the street because you don't know what kind of day that cop is having and you have no idea what a simple wave can do, can change a day around. Uh, so just keep them in your prayers. And as always, our little plug, youtube.com slash at Gold Shields. Hit that subscribe button. Visit us on thegoldshieldshow.com. Hit that contact. Let us know what you think. Give us some suggestions about a show. We always love reading them. And Dan and I read them and get back to you ourselves. No one else does it. Me and Dan do it. Check out Zone 7 on every conceivable place you can think of. It is a masterpiece of a show. So please, Zone 7 with Shar McCollum. Uh, for my partner, Dan, and one more time for Shar McCollum, this is Tom Smith from Gold Shields. Everyone, please stay safe, and we'll see everybody soon.